Amen. Amen. He's not done. Amen. Thank Aren't you glad about that? Yes, sir. I would hate for this to be the finished product. <laughs> Somebody know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, when he gets finished, I'll be exactly what he wants me to do. God bless you, choir. Thank you for encouraging our hearts to sing praises to our great King. Well, let us stand for our res responsive reading from the Word of God. It's on page six of your programs. as well. I was just thinking again, um, please be in prayer for our dear, dear little brother, <coughs> uh, brother Justin Lawrence, his wife. Mm -hmm. um, everything is going well and uh, the Lord, pray that the Lord will bring this sweet little one in. She doesn't look anything like it, but Sister Sandra will be a grandmother. <laughs> no one will believe it. <laughs> if she goes anywhere holding that baby, no one will believe it. <laughs> but that's God's preservation, isn't it? But please pray, okay? Pray and pray some more. You there? Yes, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Authority to cast out demons. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bornerges, that, that is, sons of thunder. Together and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Wow. That's the word of God. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it is time now for the preaching and teaching of your word. And Heavenly Father, no one is sufficient for this. It's only by your grace that preaching can take place. I am here, Father, to do your bidding. I'm here for your purpose. So I yield to the Holy Spirit. He can take, he can take control of my mind my emotions and my will so that I preach the word as you use Paul to instruct Timothy. I want to preach the word. Your word, Father, not my words, not popular words, not the words of a culture or this fallen world. I want to preach your word. 
Will you give me grace to do that? Yes. Heavenly Father, I pray for grace for the hearers of your word. I pray that you would shape and mold hearts to be submissive to your word, to be obedient to your word, to be devoted to your word, to honoring and to glorifying you, Holy Spirit, Illumine minds to see, open hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And since I am asking all of this of you, nothing else makes sense but to ascribe glory, honor, and praise to you. In the perfect name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, I ask, Amen. <laughs> Pray as we try to look at these names today, all right? <laughs> My subject, Extraordinary Men. Extraordinary Men. But notice, there's a question mark. Okay. Oh, that's uh, it's my theme running through that. Okay, my my subject today is extraordinary men, and and we are looking at the master's plan. Uh, being is right on that. Okay, we're looking at the master's plan as we think through the identification of the twelve. Today, I want to I want you to think with me about extraordinary men? Question mark. Don't leave the question mark off. You're going to be encouraged today. Strengthened through the ministry of God's word. As we think through this together, these names here in verses 16 through 19. It's clear that Jesus chose 12 men to be his official representatives. It's clear, but sometimes when we think about what the Lord did with and through these men, sometimes it's not so clear that Jesus chose 12 common, ordinary men. The twelve were not from the established religious elite. None were Pharisees, Sadducees, priests, Levites, rabbis, or scribes. And I'm not arguing that they were extraordinary men because they were not. <laughs> None were exceptionally wealthy with the possible exception of Matthew, the, the uh, thief. <laughs> who was extorting money from his fellow Jews. Nor were the apostles chosen from, if you will, the intellectual elite, the Old Testament scholars, the, the literate, highly educated, the theologically astute. Instead, they were uneducated and untrained men noteworthy only for having been with Jesus. Mm. Acts 4.13 Several were fishermen. One was a tax collector and hence a traitor to his people. people. Another was a political revolutionary. All except for Judas Iscariot were Galileans scorned as unsophisticated and uncouth by the more cultured Judeans. Yet, the lives and ministries of these men, minus Judas Iscariot and including Paul, the lives and ministry of these men would change the course of history. 
So I already answered my subject question, extraordinary men, question mark. The answer, no. Extraordinary man, put the question mark there, the answer, no. Extraordinary people, saved by God's grace, extraordinary people, the answer, no. Everybody's ordinary. However, extraordinary, magnificent, marvelous, altogether lovely, holy, righteous God, yes. That's why we are who we are. Yeah. Your hearts will be blessed this morning, okay? Your, your hearts will be blessed this morning as we think through extraordinary men. No. I want to hammer you with this this morning. Jesus chose 12 ordinary men. He chose 12 ordinary men. As we look at this together in verses 16 and 19, we, 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 we have already seen the praying Savior, and he's taught us the priority of prayer. We've already seen the Savior who summons or chooses and calls whom he wills. And we've already seen... Uh, the, the, the effectualness of that call, they came to him, right? He appointed them. He named them apostles, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Naming denotes authority. Remember, remember Adam named the animals. He had authority over them. He named them apostles. And they didn't go out immediately. They had to be with him. Okay, they had to be with him. With him so that he could send them out to preach. Never get the order mixed up. Okay? You've got to be with him. That's what discipleship consists of. Being with Christ in an intimate, ongoing eternal relationship. And he gave them authority to cast out demons. Okay, he gave them authority. The apostles had this authority. You know, uh, every Christian wasn't walking around casting out demons. The authority authenticated them as men who had been with Jesus because Jesus did that. Right? So, Jesus chose 12 ordinary men. Let's, let, let's look together at the identity of the 12. Beginning here in verse uh, 16, there are three groups in which the 12 were divided. Also, uh, no matter which gospel, which of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, uh, you see these names in each of the three groups of apostles always began with the same individual. The first group always begins with Peter. The second group always begins with Philip. And the third group always begins with James, son of Alphaeus. Peter all, always appears first within the listing of the apostles. His real name was Simon, but he received a nickname by Christ, Peter, which Christ used to refer to him. At, at times he didn't refer to him as Peter. He referred to him as Simon when he was acting in the old way. But the Lord would transform Peter into Simon, excuse me, into Peter, the rock. He would, he would be grounded, steadfast leader of the apostles. That's why Jesus gave him the name Peter, which means rock. You see that in Matthew 16, 18 as well. As well. So his placement here in the list clearly identified him as the leader of the group of leaders. He was the most prominent of the band of the 12, 
always being with Jesus on any of the occasions when there was a smaller intimate group with him. He was in the inner circle, if you will. You know, by the way, side note here. Leadership is influence. Yeah. All right? Leadership is influence. Be it negative or positive is influence. Right? David Koresh was an ungodly leader. But you cannot argue that he did not have influence. Peter was a man that God, the Lord Jesus, was working in. And God made Peter an influential man. A leader, by definition, has to have somebody following him. I can't say I'm Pastor Jacks if I come out here every Sunday and there's no one here. Who am I shepherding? I don't shepherd chairs. Okay? That's a sad one. Peter was a leader. And, 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 and as we go through the Gospel of Mark, if you look at Matthew and, and Luke, uh, he spoke on behalf of the group. Really, mostly all the time. But definitively, after Christ's resurrection and enthronement, you have Peter. You see him in Acts 2. Standing up to preach. His prominence manifests itself uh, 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 beginning in Acts because Peter, if you will, as he preached there on the day of Pentecost, he opened the doors of the church. <laughs> he preached the first message of the newly found uh, institution called the church. He's ushering in every racial group into the church. Jew, Samaritans, Gentiles. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts chapter 10. Right? Peter. He further guided the entire church through its initial growth phase before Paul took up the mantle. That's Peter. Yes. We, uh, we then have the two brothers, James and John, the sons of, of Zebedee, with James always appearing first. James was the oldest of the two. They were fishermen. They were in an established business of some length of they were two of the earliest followers, actually, of Christ, along with Peter and Andrew, the, the, the two other brothers on, on the list. They have this nickname. Jesus gave them, Bornergy, Sons of Thunder. That, that was not a compliment. <laughs> that nickname was due to their fiery disposition and attitude toward... Uh, those they deemed to disagree with them and, and their mission. They want to call down fire. Heaven on people to disagree with them. <laughs> James, you remember, this James right here was the first martyr of the group. In Acts chapter 12, you remember James was beheaded. He was the first martyr, the first one to die for the cause of Christ. And his brother, John, right, had the longest ministry of the 12. He ministered almost to the end of the first century. Two brothers in, that the Lord used in a great way. One dies as a martyr. The one has the longest ministry. We have him in the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, right? Finally, in reference to these two brothers, it is held by most conservatives that uh, the younger brother, John here, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. The beloved disciples, those designations are, are found in the Gospel of, of John. He wrote the Gospel of, of John. Now, he was close to Christ. But yet, Peter was clearly the leader. 
Jesus doesn't let closeness define what he does. The last disciple in the group was Andrew. That's Peter's brother. Andrew, that's Peter's brother. Most people know Andrew only as the brother of Peter. But it was actually Andrew who introduced Peter to Jesus in the first place. Andrew liked bringing people to Jesus. You find that in John 1, 35 through 42. It, 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 and, and it was he who was a disciple before he and his older brother were called to follow Christ. You remember when a group of uh, Gentiles wanted to uh, get an audience with Jesus at, at the time of his triumphal interest uh, in John 12, 20 through 22, in the city of Jerusalem, they, they turned to Philip. You know who Philip turned to? Andrew. Andrew was the intermediary. Then we come to Philip. I can only, I can only give you brief identifications of these men, okay? Dr. Lawson, bless us, already preached uh, each one of these men. <laughs> One uh, a sermon apiece, all twelve. <laughs> Philip, however, stands at the head of the second group. Now, 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 like Peter, Andrew, and, uh, James, and John, Philip was also from Galilee, particularly uh, Bethsaida. That was Peter and Andrew's hometown. You remember? Philip encountered Jesus while he was in Judea, following his baptism by John. When Jesus was preparing to make his way back to Galilee, John, John chapter 1, verse 43. Now, we, we're not sure whether Philip went immediately or joined Christ later after John was arrested. Uh, we don't know, but it seems pretty clear that Philip may have been a disciple of John prior to being a disciple of Christ. Philip was a guy who was who expressed great concern for the Old Testament. He had a concern for his fellow Jews, but he also had a questioning disposition. Philip would ask questions. Think of him in John 14. Master, how can we know the way? Philip, have I been so long with you? <laughs> the truth in the life. But I like Philip though because although the rest of them or some others may have known, he was honest. He asked the question. All of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, follow Philip with Bartholomew. Now that's a bit of a little challenge here. Matthew and Luke mention a Bartholomew, but nowhere else mentions his name, nor does he appear in the Gospel of John. However, the Gospel of John does mention Nathaniel. So most scholars con conclude that Bartholomew is Nathaniel, okay? He's Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was brought to Jesus by guess who? Philip. He was doubtful at first, but when he met Jesus, <laughs> that changed his whole disposition. You'll find that in John 1, 45 through 51. He's another Galilean, by the way. The next person on Mark's list was Matthew. We, we've already talked about Matthew. We know who Matthew was. We saw him in, in chapter 2 of, of Mark. He's the Levite. He's the tax gatherer. He, he was a wealthy but shunned man. We know his story well, don't we? Then there's Thomas. 
Thomas may be one of the most well known of the, of the lesser known apostles because of his hesitancy, remember, to recognize or acknowledge the resurrection of Christ based on the confession of the other apostles. We also know that he, he is about his failure to understand Jesus' description of his heavenly return in John 14 and John 20. Thomas was a twin. He was a twin, Didymus, right? That meant twin. Thomas, Thomas gets a pretty bad rap because of that resurrection appearance that he, he failed to acknowledge the confession of the other apostles. He said, I gotta see him, I gotta put my hands, right? Mm -hmm. So he gets a bad rap and we call him Doubting Thomas. Don't we? <laughs> We like to, this is not good though, we, we like to identify people by one bad thing that they've done that stands out and discount anything else, don't we? That's right, that's right. There he is, down Thomas! <laughs> I remember when he did that. <laughs> now we don't like people to do that to us, but we like to do that to other people. We don't just identify them and define their whole life by one thing, don't we? But I want you to remember, according to John eleven sixteen, Thomas was prepared to die with Jesus. I want you to remember well, what he said when he, when he did see Jesus. According to John 20 and 28, you have, you have this profound, and I do mean profound, confession of Jesus, Jesus' identity. Thomas said, my Lord and, and my God. That's a profound confession the identity of Christ. So don't just define him as doubting Thomas, okay? The third group began with James, the son of Alphaeus. We actually do not have this designation appearing anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, we do have another James with whom this James is normally identified. According to the Gospel of Mark at the crucifixion, that there was a group of ladies one of them being a certain Mary, you remember? John 15 and 40. She's mentioned again in John 16 verse one and was also distinguished from the mother of James, the son of Zebedee, whom I just mentioned a moment ago. It's called James the Younger, probably smaller in stature as well. Most scholars can conclude that this is the James. This is the James that is mentioned here. Next we have Thaddeus. Probably if we surveyed, surveyed the audience prior to this or prior to reading this, said, uh, do you know any of Jesus' disciples? Did you know one of them was named Thaddeus? Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Thaddeus, this was by all likelihood uh, a nickname to distinguish him from Judas. And I say that because Luke's gospel, uh, in Luke's gospel, Thaddeus is referred to as Judas, son of James. The name Thaddeus comes from the idea of beloved or large hearted. You with me? Speak, speaking of uh, the disposition that the Lord had given him and really distinguished him from Judas Iscariot. So like, for example, uh, he, he's found in John 14, 22. Uh, you see the designation Judas, then it has in parentheses, not Iscariot. Well, that's Thaddeus. Are you with me? Different man from Judas because of God's grace. We then have Simon, Simon is the zealot. This man was a revolutionary. He was a Jew sworn to the overthrow of the Roman government. 
He would have been a very proud, radical, outspoken, fiery, fearless man. If you will, revolutionary game banger. Yeah. <laughs> Take the Romans down. And then finally, we come to the last in the list, Judas Iscariot. Y'all know him. He's the one who ended up betraying Jesus. He's the only one that, that uh, is referenced here that is not a Galilean. He's from Judea. He's mentioned. He's mentioned more than the lesser known disciples. Not in a positive note, but he's mentioned more because he was a thief. Externally, he was a man that evidenced trustworthiness, faithfulness. How do I know that? They made him the treasurer. Right? But he was a thief. You know, he was still in John 12. He was still in front of the treasury. Right? And his thieving heart. His thieving heart led him to take a down payment on betraying the Lord of glory. No wonder the church is warned. Don't elevate men to eldership who love money. Do you hear me? Don't elevate men to eldership who love money. Dismiss a whole sweep of prosperity men who clearly declare that they love money. But that's in 1 Timothy 3, verse 3, by the way. <laughs> Judas' betrayal. Did Jesus know he was going to betray him? Yeah. Well, of course he did. The 11 didn't. But Jesus knew, according to John 13, 21 through 30, Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Two of the gospel writers identify Satan as the motivation behind Judas' behavior. Luke 22, verse 3, John 13, verse 2. That tells you something about the devil. Listen to me preach. He can snatch the word out of the heart of the unconverted. And it's clearly seen in the parable of the sower, right? Yeah. But he can also ply the heart of the unconverted, placing sinful thoughts there as well. Can he do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can do that. He can snatch it out. He can ply that heart. He can, he, he can drop the seeds of sinful thoughts in the heart, right? You know how Jesus knew where Jesus would be because he watched his regular habits of prayer and where he went. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. So he could tell the soldiers exactly where he would be. Boy, that's just wicked, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. He betrayed him, didn't he? Yes. Then he had some remorse afterwards. Mm -hmm. He knew he had betrayed him some blood, Matthew 27, 3 and 4. Guess what he did? He killed himself. He never repented. Jesus knew his character from the beginning, John 6, 64. He had known from the beginning which of them did not believe in who would betray him. He had known. But he called Judas, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Judas got to hear the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, yes. Judas was there when he raised Lazarus from the dead. Judas was there when he walked on water. Judas saw the spotless Lamb of God who knew no sin. This is a warning to us. You can have privileges just like you have this morning to hear the word of God, to be in a Bible-believing church and still hate Jesus. Right? Watch this. You can be personally drawn to Christ. Eat and drink with him. 
taste something of the word of God and the power to come and still be lost. Listen to me, uh, young people. Privileges to be born in a covenant family. Saved. But privileges never saved anyone. This man is called by Christ to be an apostle, and yet he's lost. Yes. Listen to me, my brothers who have office. Office carries no merit. Yes, sir. Office doesn't save you. Yes, you know, there, there, there will be evangelists, there will be bishops, there will be popes in hell. Yes. Have I got any warriors here? Yes. Judas is an illustration of an unconverted church member. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. A friend of mine one time preached a sermon, Remember Lot's wife? And he said, Don't be in the church and go to hell. Mm. Yes, sir. You're talking about, you all remember the television show Touch Bad Angel? She's Touch Bad Angel for real. She's married to a preacher. She's led out. She has clearly what God says. Clearly. God has already started the destruction. She knows clearly what's happening behind her. She had clear instruction. Needed no exegesis. Don't look back. Can't get any clearer than that. And she still perish. Learn from Judas. There's a book out. I don't have it. I have not read it. You know, Jenny Parshall uh, on host MBW uh, highlights what would Judas do. Might be a good read. Okay. What kind of people did Jesus choose? Do you see the cream of the crop here? You see the elite, the powerful, the mighty? You see lowly fishermen and, and tradesmen, don't you? What type of people does God use? Common, normal, everyday people. Ordinary people. Uses ordinary people to accomplish his purpose. So now you never need to envy anybody. You never need to wonder if you're saved, you're sitting out there under the sound of my weak voice. Can God or will God use me? Nobody's intrinsically qualified. God has to save. God has to sanctify. God has to transform. The, the twelve are just like the rest of us. The, 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 they were selected from the unworthy and the un unqualified. They are men like Elijah, like us, with a nature like ours. They, 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 they did not rise to the highest usefulness because they were somehow different from us. Amen. They were just men on the potter's wheel. Yes, sir. So I had somebody in here. Sometimes we get discouraged, don't we? Especially when we suffer sin, failure. So we're nobodies. Well, left to ourselves, we are. But we're not left to ourselves. God chooses. Oh, I'm glad about that. I'm about to get out of lecture mode in a minute here. God chooses the lowly, the meek, and the weak. So when, when God's will and purpose is accomplished, there's never any question about who did it. <laughs> if God's word goes forth, there's not the man, it's the power of God. I like to constantly remind myself of that, and I have no problems with you reminding me of it either, okay? Apart from God, it doesn't take place. So God uses everyday people, molding and shaping them and fashioning them into what he would have them to be to serve his purpose. Just, just, we see the identity of these men, just ordinary men. But I want you to notice the, secondly, the, the diversity of the twelve. This is a diverse group and I, I certainly don't have time to go into all of the diversity that we see here, but I want to highlight two of them. I want to highlight two of them and make some uh, 
points from this. They're different. I want to highlight two to illustrate diversity. And that's Matthew and Simon the Zealot. Matthew, who, who was he? He's the tax gatherer. Who did he work for? He worked for Rome. Right? He chose Matthew. And then he chose Simon. Simon is the revolutionary. Simon was one of those Jews who, were, who was in active opposition against Roman authority. Violent opposition. He would have been a violent man. Simon would have killed Matthew the drop of hand. He would have. Simon's whole aim was to overthrow the, uh, 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 the Romans whom Matthew worked for. So not only would he have killed him at the drop of a hat, he hated him. This is, this is like bringing the Crips and the Bloods into a, a, into a small room and say, okay, can't you guys just get along? And both of them have AK-47s. These guys are on opposite ends. <coughs> that illustrates diversity, doesn't it? Yes. I like what I learned from Tony Evans years ago, but he was talking about in the context of marriage. He said, yeah, we want diversity in marriage. If both of you are the same, then one, if one of you is unnecessary. <laughs> See, in the church, there's no Greek, Roman, master, slave, Get, they have some special privileges that others don't have. No, in, in the church, you know, men are not allowed to get closer to God than women. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Everybody can run equally, crying out with Father. All yeah. yeah. oh, hey, glory that matters in the church of Christ is that you and I have Christ. It's Christ that unifies us. That's a natural, that answers the natural question. How in the world could Jesus bring Simon in the same group with Matthew? We, 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 history, history records their accomplishments, their unity, but they're so different. Mm -hmm. That's Christ. Amen. Christ unifies people. <laughs> Watch this. You need to hear me preaching right now. Christ trumped and removed all differences that tend to separate and disunify, and he makes into one a group of men who would naturally be enemies. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to hit you with this one. Yeah, I'm going to hit you with this one. We just can't get along. Do you see Matthew and Simon in here? Who, who knows? Simon may have had a few weapons on him when Jesus called him. <laughs> right? I got some warriors in this house. No, no, no. Christ unifies hearts. Christ trumps everything. Christ can bring men and women together who are naturally enemies, but we find our commonality in Christ. We find our unity in Christ. We find humility in Christ. We find joy in Christ. We find uni unification in Christ alone. So usually, it's a Christ problem. Y'all don't hear me. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a Christ problem. Yeah. <laughs> Not in the sense of Christ being at fault. We don't want to bow and submit to Christ. Right? Unity is important to the health of the church. Jesus prayed for it in John chapter 17, didn't he? And, and, and I'm telling you, dividing the body of Christ is a great sin. Paul calls the, the church the body, doesn't it? But you know what, what, what else he says about the body? So much diversity. Mm -hmm. Different gifts of the spirit. Why would you give different gifts? Gifts? Why would you have such diversity in order to benefit the whole? <laughs> but 
why don't people with such diversity use their gifts to benefit the whole because of Christ? If you're a Christian and Jesus is your Lord, you're part of the body of Christ called the church. You know where the body of Christ, the body of Christ which we are part, it's visibly manifest. The body of Christ is visibly manifest in the local church. Anybody here with me? We've been given gifts, right? And he wants us to exercise our gifts in the context of the local church for the common good of the body, not for our enjoyment or for our benefit. Right? He brought diversity. It's diversity in here, isn't it? And I'm not talking about skin color either. You're not me. Right? How about I got some warriors? If you think about what I'm saying this morning, and you'll probably want to go home and, and really study this out some more. She might not like it. There's no biblical justification whatsoever for this widespread tendency among evangelicals to confess Jesus is Lord, but fail to participate in the life of the church by joining a particular congregation. Where did they confess Jesus as Lord and what context were they in? The church. Who are you identifying with? The church in baptism. Who are you confessing? Who do you identify with? Well, you don't stand somewhere in a ditch and tell a bunch of sinners to come and watch me be baptized. You are identifying with the church, the body of Christ. I'm church Christian, is truly an oxymoron. <laughs> Let's tie together some things we're learning before I go to my final point. He builds his church from people of different temperaments and backgrounds. Amen. Jesus does that. We see that clearly in here, right? Jesus unites people who would otherwise be enemies. We see that clearly, right? Jesus calls unexpected and unlikely people like you and I to carry out his mission. We see that clearly, don't we? Jesus transforms people in the course of serving him. That's what he did in here, right? With these men, right? Jesus equips those whom he calls to serve him. He gave them authority, didn't he? Jesus brings out the best in those who serve him because of he puts that into them, right? One more point of application. Jesus allows false individuals among those who claim to serve him. Judas. Diverse group. We own diversity. We love diversity. You know why? Because Jesus loved diversity. He loves diversity in the Bible. When you get to heaven, you know what you'll see? Uh, you're going to see diversity. Right? Amen. I'll be in Donald Jackson heaven. Uh, you're all quiet, right? <laughs> oh, well, well, well who, who am I going to be? Who, who will I be then? <laughs> Rufus Mandy? <laughs> no, God's bringing Eddie Donald Jackson to heaven. And he's bringing Eddie Darrell Jacks to heaven. Lose the office. Right? There'll be recognition in heaven. Doesn't make sense without it. Right? Right. That's diversity. We love diversity, don't we? Don't criticize people for being different. Right? God did that. And also resurrected. Whoever the Lord sends through those doors, don't turn your nose up, turn your heart over. 
They may not look like you. They may not dress like you. Right? But open your heart. Jesus loves diversity. Just use your gifts to benefit the whole. Right? Everybody knows fruit. Fruit trees are not sitting in yard saying, check me out, I'm pretty in red apple. Wow, look at my leaves, all green. Now that fruit tree wants somebody to come take a bite. And know that the sap running through is good sap. The role of the twelve in Mark's gospel, and, I, and I'll close out. Why, why would I think, why do I want you to think about the role of the twelve in Mark's gospel? The twelve actually have a predominantly negative role in Mark's gospel. I assume you've been reading it, okay? If you look at Matthew's gospel, for example, um, you see the disciples in process, right? And I'm not saying they're not in Mark's, Mark's gospel, he just doesn't highlight it. You look at Luke's gospel, they're, they're, they're training, getting ready for them to step out in Acts, right? They're gonna be the ones to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. But Mark, Mark has the most negative portrait of the 12 disciples in any other gospel. Then Luke, then Matthew or John, Mark highlights their failure to understand the teaching of Christ, their, their, their failure to understand especially the suffering role of, of, of the Messiah. He highlights their pride and their self-interest. Let me give you just one little example of what I'm talking about. Critical time in Jesus' life, guess why? He's on his way to Calvary. He's getting ready to have some prayer for communion with the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know it well. It's just before his betrayal. He goes to the Garden because that's, that, that was the place he frequently went and prayed out of deep concern for the upcoming circumstances. And he takes his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He takes them farther than the rest. He went to pray and communicated to them the importance of joining him in prayer. You, you find that in Mark chapter 14, 32 through 34. Came back, guess what they were doing? Sleep. He spoke to the leader, Peter, in Mark 14, 37 and 38. And, 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 and he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? I wonder if he says that on Wednesday night. Watch and pray. <laughs> that you may not enter into tempt temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. These men struggled. And Mark highlights that they struggled spiritually. They sometimes evidence such pettiness and power conflicts that we're going to see later. They denied knowing Jesus at crunch time. You know what in the end? They would not believe him regarding his resurrection, although they saw him walk on water. Yes, they saw him raise Larry, La La Lazarus. The, the, the three in the inner circle were in there when he raised Jarius' daughter. They saw miracle after miracle. They saw him take two fish and five loaves and feed probably 10,000 people. Miracle after miracle after miracle. They saw him. Didn't they see him? Yeah. And they wouldn't believe him regarding his resurrection, even after all they saw. Yes. Jesus had to constantly correct them. I'm closing. It's helping me right here. He had to bring them back constantly. He had to clarify. He had to continue to explain his ministry and his mission. They're thinking one thing, Jesus is in a whole nother different world. He has to continue to bring them back to his world to explain and understand 
that he must go to Calvary. And in the end, they still didn't get it until after he had to come back again. You know, you know something? Mark does not even relate the restoration after the resurrection. We know they were, right? We know that, right? It, it, it's implied in a narrative, but Mark doesn't specifically state it. He said, Pastor, why are you bringing this up? Because Mark wants us to understand something. These 12 men are not the model to follow. Y'all didn't hear me preach. <laughs> Mark sets Jesus forth as the suffering servant. And you remember what Jesus said? He says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Okay, let's look at Mark's gospel. Mm, who was it now that actually did that? See, what's wasn't Nathaniel. It wasn't Matthew. It wasn't Thomas. It wasn't Peter, James, or John. Certainly was not Judas. So who was it that actually took up the cross and went to Calvary? <laughs> you all don't hear me, do you? <laughs> oh, I remember now. It was the Lord of glory, wasn't it? It was Jesus Christ himself. He was the only one. He was the only one that took up the cross and went all the way to Calvary and died and paid a price that he didn't owe because you and I owe the price that we could not pay. Right? Right? It was nobody but Jesus Christ. And Mark is telling us, he's telling you and me, if you want the ultimate model of discipleship, don't look at Matthew. Don't look at Matthew. Don't look at James, John, all of those guys. Don't set them forth as your heroes. If you want the ultimate disciple to follow, you better make sure you set your eyes on Christ. Right? Why Christ? Because he's the one. Oh my goodness. He's the one who stayed faithful. Why Christ? Because he's the one that followed the Father's plan all the way to the end to suffer and die. Why Christ? Because he's the one to whom the Father spoke about. This is my beloved Son. In him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Do you remember Mark's context? Remember he's talking to a persecuted church. Don't forget that. He's talking to a persecuted church. He wants to encourage them. They're being persecuted under Nero, remember? What is he saying to them? He's saying, if you want to endure all of this unjust persecution, you better make sure you keep your eyes, the eyes of your heart, stay fixed on the perfect model, Jesus. Right? I close, extraordinary men, question mark, answer? No. Extraordinary Christ, no question mark, add a lot more to it. Yes, to God be glory.